Good morning, salam, sabakhir. Hame khush amadid. I'm Vahid Aragband, and uh, uh, my job this morning is to get this show going as fast as we can and uh, delve into all of these uh, wonderful papers that are being presented. Uh, so uh, let me just start uh, there, uh, say, by, by saying there are too many stars in this room for me to start mentioning them and uh, trying to recognize them. So forgive me, all of you stars. Um, I, I, we do that when you sit in on panels and the panel chairs will introduce everyone. Um, but we are indeed um, uh, honored to have so many people of so much academic uh, institutional distinction uh, amongst us. It's a really a happy day for uh, Iran, I think, and a happy day for Iran Heritage Foundation to have you all here. Uh, the order of the day is this. Uh, we are going to um, uh, basically start with a, a quick welcome uh, panel by the organizers uh, on which I, Mrs. Sudavar, and uh, Ali Ansari will sit. Uh, then we are, going to, and we are going to just say our own small bits about uh, this event. Uh, the event is recorded and it's going to be um, uh, basically on our website eventually. So follow my uh, father's advice to me that if you don't want everybody to know about something you don't want them to know, just don't say it. And um, the um, uh, introduction of the panelists will be by the chairs, and um, then we will be followed by um, a very distinguished chair uh, uh, with uh, Martin Roth of uh, the Vienna Museum, John Snow, uh, and uh, Neil McGregor from the British Museum, uh, who will basically share their thoughts about this event and Iran generally with us. This is a panel. Uh, of Iran enthusiasts, uh, and it always, uh, um, I'm always surprised when I talk to them, they even manage to inspire me, who come with inspired genes on Iran every time I talk to them. So it's a great privilege uh, to have them with us today. With that, I would like to then introduce uh, Mrs. Sudavar and uh, Ali Ansari, please to come to the uh, panel so we could say our bits and get the show going. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let me introduce uh, our partners um, for this conference, uh, Sudavar Foundation and BIPS. The um, official CVs are in the documents that John have, has given you. So instead of going repeating all that stuff, let me just very briefly say uh, what our experience with these wonderful partners is. Sudavar family are known to everybody in this room. They are the family in Iran, a giant of a family, really, uh, in anything which is arts, um, culture, and we are truly privileged to have today uh, both uh, uh, Mrs. Sudavar, Fatima, and Abol Ala, and I'm very glad to see the next generation also sitting uh, already in the room and engaged uh, with the IHF. Uh, the sign of the family, uh, Mrs. Sudavar, unfortunately passed away uh, last year, uh, but I, I cannot think of any life that I can think of which has delivered more in terms of direct contribution uh, to Iran's culture and heritage. So it is a true privilege to have the Sudavar family associated with us. Uh, I have been working with this family now for, uh, this is the third event we are doing with them in three years. I have learned so much from my association with Abu and Fatima and all of us have, and uh, uh, we hope that this becomes a sustainable partnership between the IHF and the Sudabar Foundation as we move on. Ali Ansari is also known to all of you in this room. Uh, we call him uh, the bowl of energy uh, in my household. Uh, we uh, uh, met Ali several years ago when he was thinking about setting up the Center for Iranian Studies 
at St. Andrews University. And I think we made a small contribution as IHF to that effort, which now gathers some of the best and the brightest in this country in the field of Iranian studies uh, in that very cold city, St. Andrews. Uh, we told the university, uh, we will support you if what you are trying to do is leads to a sustainable center. Um, efforts are wonderful, but sustainable efforts which make an impact are even better. So we encourage the university to think about a five-year program and about a long-term commitment uh, to uh, um, a sustainable Iranian studies program. And Ali uh, was obviously the man who drove all of that and delivered what I think today is uh, a thriving and probably one of the leading centers for Iranian studies uh, worldwide. So uh, it's a great pleasure to also have Ali supporting this exhibition uh, through uh, uh, BIPS. With that, if I could please pass to you, Mrs. Sudavar, and then to Ali to please make your remarks. Oh. Okay. On behalf, oh, it's a bit too loud now. <laughs> On behalf of the Sudavav Memorial Foundation, I would like to welcome and thank the speakers and the guests for their participation and truly heartwarming interest in this event. About three years ago, when I drew attention to the importance of Iran's deteriorating national and cultural heritage, I hardly imagined that my appeal would bear fruit so soon but one can count on Vahid and Maryam al to make things happen. After last year's highly successful environmental conference, our joint collaboration with Iran Heritage is focusing this year on cultural heritage with the support of BIPS and the Flora Family Foundation. Let us hope it bodes well for collaborative efforts on cultural heritage at the time and in a neighborhood where we have seen the testimony of great civilizations suffer serious and at times irreversible damage. Cultural heritage is no less important than natural heritage. What biodiversity is to nature, cultural diversity is to identity and to its creative genius in all its manifestations. While the former is vital to our physical survival, the latter is essential to our understanding of who we are and a source of inspiration to be drawn upon by generation after generation. Iran is particularly fortunate in being blessed with a diversity of monuments and archaeological sites that chart the progress of civilization, not only on a national level, but on a global scale. This renders the conservation of Iran's rich heritage all the more urgent as it faces challenges from natural erosion, environmental pollution, vandalism, bad taste, mindless urban development, and last but not least, indiscriminate sanctions that affect both natural and cultural heritage to the detriment of all. We cannot afford to remain indifferent, if only it's for the sake of future generations. Although the challenges faced by Iran's heritage are neither as dramatic nor as immediate as in Iraq and Syria, where part of an equally diverse and rich heritage is irretrievably lost, longer term the potential risk may be proved to be as damaging if we do not act now. That is why we are assembled here with dedicated experts who have devoted their talents and their lives to the study and salvage of a heritage which we share with the world as our contribution. I would like to conclude with an episode from the life of my late mother, a known patron of the arts, who passed at age 101 last June. Years before she donated her art collection to her father's endowment, the Malik Library and Museum in Tehran, where it had been seen in a special wing dedicated to her memory, she was sitting in her house in the center of Tehran, surrounded by her cherished artworks, as missiles showered on Tehran during the, at the height of the Iran-Iraq war. Despite entreaties that she, she refused to take shelter and abandon her collection to vandals and looters. To her, the sanctity of cultural heritage was greater than the sanctity of life. She viewed artistic creation as the material manifestation of the best that human genius can produce. And it outlives our mortal coils to provide lessons from the past for future generations. It is in that spirit and in tribute to the sanctity of human genius that we are proud to support the cultural heritage of, an Iran, of Iran as an integral part of human heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sudabar. Now, Ali. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Vahid, for those very warm words uh, in your introduction. I'm here in my uh, capacity as president of the British Institute of Persian Studies, which is very pleased to be supporting this conference. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, uh, BIPS, as it's known by its acronym, is, uh, was founded in 1961 as an institute of the British Academy to help foster, encourage, and promote the study of Iran, um, both within and uh, outside the country. Um, as part of our remit, we're encouraged to obviously engage in as many collaborations and collaborative research projects as we can. Um, it sometimes hasn't been as easy as we, as we would like, but we're still there, and we hope that we can look to the, uh, uh, uplit, uh, the, 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 the bright future of, of, of greater uh, cooperation. And it's in this uh, light that we're very pleased that we are working uh, once again with the Iran Heritage Foundation. I must admit, when... Uh, uh, John mentioned, John Curtis mentioned to me about, you know, this, this conference uh, uh, and its, and its uh, stellar panels and the people he wished to invite from Iran. We did sort of wonder, you know, how easy it was going to be to manage such a thing. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see so many colleagues, so many colleagues uh, from Iran who've been able to come and uh, participate in this conference with colleagues from, from Britain, Europe, and around the world. This is really how it should be. And uh, I hope, I really earnestly hope, uh, that in the future we'll be able to do uh, more such conferences, uh, collaborations of this nature. I know John and I are now going to be in regular communication uh, to, to coordinate our activities and to really try and do things that complement each other uh, going uh, into the future. So I want to welcome you uh, once again. I think it's going to be a fascinating uh, conference. It's a enormously important topic in the circumstances that we find ourselves in the Middle East today. Unfortunately, it's uh, uh, probably even more significant. And I want to, on behalf of BIPS, really give a very, very warm welcome to our, uh, to our friends from Iran. You are, you are most welcome, and I hope you enjoy your, your stay in London. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, our um, first speaker today, of course, is Dr. John Curtis. And uh, before introducing him, I just want to um, add my two pence to this gathering. I'm a layman amongst stars and specialists here. Um, but I would like to give a layman's challenge to this group of distinguished stars. Tomorrow afternoon, when we finish this conference, uh, there, there is going to be a summing up of what we have found in this conference, and we are going to hopefully come up with ideas about what can we do about them. I think it is incumbent on all of us, uh, and I urge you to think through this as we go through the day, in addition to your contributions as panelists or by asking questions, please ask yourself two questions and then try to make a contribution at the end of the period to John and his team. One, how can we sustain this gathering as a collective? Sustainability, as the institutional partners we have here know, is at the core of everything in this business. This issue is grave, it's really important, and I think if we can sustain this gathering of friends, family really, uh, of lovers and friends of Iran, with the expertise that they have, I think we can make a difference. So one challenge I put to you is how do we make this sustainable, this, this whole effort sustainable? The second one, can we choose one or two specific projects, <coughs> excuse me, one or two specific projects that this group can say, I picked a project and I made an important difference on that one particular project. That is the outcome, specific tangible outcome of this gathering. And I would like to tell you something on behalf of my trustees and friends at the IHF. If you can find a project which is worthy of uh, doing something about, and if you can sustain this collective together, we pledge to you, uh, and I'm sure Mrs. Sudavar and Ali will also support me on that, we pledge to you that we will support that and make that happen. I think if you have the will, we will find a way to make it happen. So with that, let me uh, uh, ask John uh, Curtis to come and make his remarks.
John is known to everyone uh, in this room. I'm not going to uh, read through his credentials. Suffice it to say that uh, at the IHF, we met John uh, originally through our association with the British Museum, which is represented here by Neil McGregor, his director. Uh, British Museum is our uh, uh, longest institutional partner in this country, and we've done uh, too many things for me to be able to count. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, Neil, we could uh, uh, agree that we have uh, created sustainability in the relationship, and we have made an impact. So I think we, we get ticks on those two grounds together. Now, you have made us more sustainable by allowing us to take John away from the British <laughs> Museum <laughs> and into the IHF fold. Um, John uh, has been with us now for a year, and uh, he has made a difference between day and night at the IHF. Uh, this conference would not have been possible uh, without John's presence, and I feel this is almost 20 years of IHF, and I feel with John's arrival on the scene, uh, we have laid the foundations uh, for the next uh, 20 years of IHF. Um, one thing that um, I think is particularly pertinent, and I don't want anybody to forget about, but John doesn't like to talk about that, he always says don't embarrass me with these things, is the critical role that he played at the time of the invasion of Iraq together with Neil's uh, uh, support and, in fact, the British government support in preserving the artifacts and the treasures of Iraq. Um, Baghdad was um, open, the museums were wide open, and uh, I think uh, we, Iraq is again in the news because of ISIS and all of that. And I would like to applaud John, really, for the really courageous step that he took, actually going into Iraq in the middle of a war and together with Neil's uh, support, uh, making sure that those artifacts, uh, which were all looted practically, uh, uh, taken back to the museums. And this is a story that somebody really needs to uh, write a book on. So, John, you are uh, not only our CEO and very distinguished scholar, but we really consider you to be a hero in terms of uh, saving all of those artifacts and our heritage in the region. John Curtis. Um, my intention um, this morning in this brief talk is to set the scene uh, for later papers about uh, Iranian cultural heritage, and I'm going to describe um, the general Middle East. Put, I try and put that into a general um, Middle Eastern context as we realize that it would be um, strange, perhaps even perverse, to discuss Iran without talking uh, about what is going on um, in the rest of the region. So that's what um, I'm going to do. Um, and this is particularly important because the last 35 years have seen unparalleled damage um, to cultural heritage uh, in, the, in, in the Middle East. Uh, and I'm going to uh, consider this morning Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and then say something briefly um, about, uh, about uh, Iran. Well, in Afghanistan, the turbulent period, uh, beginning with the Soviet invasion in 1979, um, has seen great damage to the cultural heritage um, there. And during the next 35 years, um, we saw the withdrawal of the Soviet army in 1989, the civil war, the coming of the Taliban in 1996, and the occupation by Allied forces from 2001 uh, onwards. And during this time, many archaeological sites plundered, uh, many um, museums um, were looted. Uh, the National Museum in Kabul was not only um, looted extensively between 1992 and 1995, but in 1993, the museum building was shelled and badly damaged. Um, one incident stands out um, as being particularly shocking, and that's the destruction um, of the Bamiyan Buddhas that were blown up by the Taliban um, in 2001. The uh, Bamiyan Valley was belatedly um, inscribed as a World Heritage Site um, uh, by UNESCO in 2003, but even if it had been inscribed earlier, uh, probably um, wouldn't have made uh, any difference. 
And around the same time that the Buddhas um, were blown up, many objects in the Kabul Museum um, were uh, damaged but destroyed, particularly um, those showing human figures, human forms, uh, which were therefore regarded as idolatrous. And around 2,500 important works uh, were destroyed um, at, um, at that time. One should actually perhaps here uh, pay tribute in passing um, to the dedication of uh, the museum staff uh, in uh, Kabul, uh, who did a very great deal um, to try and uh, salvage the, the cultural heritage. And those of you who went to the British Museum um, exhibition in, uh, uh, to, in 2012 um, will, have, um, will have seen um, that in this way some uh, remarkable things um, were uh, actually preserved. Well, built monuments in Afghanistan have also um, suffered grievously, particularly in Herat, uh, Jam, and, uh, and, and Balkh. And before leaving Afghanistan, uh, I'd like to mention the uh, antiquities uh, trade um, which uh, has led to so many uh, sites in Afghanistan being plundered and looted, uh, a very great deal of uh, illegal um, excavation there. And that's a problem um, which I'm afraid is prevalent throughout um, the whole region. Well, moving on to um, Syria, uh, as is well known, the, Syria, the, the civil war uh, has been a catastrophe for Syrian cultural heritage. Um, all six um, world heritage sites uh, in Syria have um, been badly damaged. Um, there's Aleppo up there, the historic uh, towns of North Syria there, uh, Palmyra over here, the castle of Krakhti Chevalier there, uh, Damascus and, uh, and, and Basra. And in addition to those six World Heritage Sites, um, 11 sites on UNESCO's tentative list, including Apamea, um, have also been uh, badly damaged. And Apamea, uh, some of the wonderful mosaic floors, um, have been stolen. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. We'll um, start our Syrian review um, with, uh, with Aleppo. Um, as you uh, are well aware, it attracted a lot of attention in the Western press. Um, fire swept through the medieval uh, souk, which was being uh, occupied by um, anti-government uh, forces. And the souk itself and surrounding buildings um, were very badly damaged, probably um, beyond repair. Um, also, the famous um, Umayyad uh, mosque in the old city. Uh, this is the mosque that supposedly contains the remains of John the Baptist's father, badly damaged in uh, April 2003. And as well as the minaret um, being destroyed, um, the very important library um, of, um, of this mosque um, was burnt. Um, even the famous uh, caravan city of um, uh, Palmyra um, w was damaged, and in the monumental um, temple of Baal, which became a defensive um, position, uh, many holes can be seen from uh, shells and bullets uh, in the wall of the temple, and two of the columns in the southern portico um, have collapsed, and also the uh, necropolis at Palmyra um, was uh, attacked by uh, looters um, in just recently, actually, in uh, last November, uh, who broke into one of the tombs and stole 22 funerary busts. Um, then in terms of um, more modern buildings, uh, no less interest, uh, sorry, no, it's Crac de, Crac de Chevalier um, first. Uh, you can see that uh, quite a lot of um, um, damage here. Um, and uh, this is a modern building um, built around uh, uh, 1930, but still very interesting uh, in its own right. It uh, uh, was the seat of the uh, governor um, of, um, of Aleppo. 
Well, many uh, individuals and institutions, um, including UNESCO actually, have been busy recording damage um, in Syria, but I'd particularly like to draw, the, to, uh, draw attention um, to the work of uh, Emma Cunliffe, a, a postgraduate student in um, Durham University, who was one of the first people um, to start recording everything conscientiously um, on a website. Um, moving on now. Um, to Iraq and uh, problems here. Um, started in earnest at the time of the first Gulf War uh, in 1990, was extensive uh, looting of um, archaeological sites and the um, plundering of some um, provincial museums, uh, but these problems became much worse uh, at the time of the uh, second Gulf War, and many of the sites in southern Iraq, south of Baghdad, um, were uh, badly looted, such as uh, Isin, where you can see the whole of the surface of the mound um, is covered with holes resulting from um, illegal excavations. And this is uh, the site of Lhasa, not, uh, not quite so bad, which um, I visited with the British Army in 2007. Um, then at the famous site, the Sumerian site of um, Ur of the Chaldees, the problems um, were a bit different um, here. Um, the ziggurat um, was damaged in 1990, actually um, by uh, coalition troops on their way um, northwards um, towards Baghdad. Um, in the second um, Gulf War, the problems came about because of the extension of this uh, air base at uh, Talil, um, which became the largest military um, air base uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Um, there wasn't actually um, any looting, but um, there were problems um, caused by the uncontrolled visits to the site of thousands of um, coalition soldiers, and that inevitably caused wear and tear on the standing remains. And also, um, some damage was caused uh, by, um, uh, by insurgents firing rockets at the airbase, which fell short and landed on the archaeological sites. But um, if coalition troops didn't consciously cause damage at Ur, they certainly did um, at Babylon. Now, even though um, Babylon was badly treated um, in the time of um, Saddam, he created a huge artificial mound on the site and built a palace on top of it. Um, and there was also uh, some looting. Uh, at the beginning of the um, Second Gulf War, but these things um, were no excuse um, for the way that the coalition treated Babylon. And the site, one of the most famous, as you know, in the ancient world, was turned uh, into a military camp. And in that process, um, a lot of damage was done. Um, Long trenches um, were, were dug um, through, sometimes through previously undisturbed archaeological deposits. This one uh, on the top left is nearly 200 meters long. And uh, the antiquities uh, found, uh, like pots and bricks with inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar, were thrown onto the piles of earth um, lining the trenches. Um, a heliport um, was uh, established and lots of earth scooped up um, to fill uh, these so-called um, HESCO containers. Then heavy military vehicles were driven around the site, uh, including along the ancient professional way, which resulted in all the ancient paving slabs um, being broken and also uh, bricks were pulled out of the uh, Ishtar Gate Foundations, uh, presumably by coalition soldiers looking for souvenirs, uh, and antiquities were sometimes um, found during routine searches of um, departing troops, this one uh, on one occasion while I was there. Um, well, moving on now to the Iraq Museum 
to the uh, Iraq Museum. Um, as you all know, this was badly looted in April um, 2003, and although uh, American troops eventually came um, to guard the museum, um, it was too late. By that time, um, objects remaining in the galleries have been smashed and broken, uh, and some iconic objects um, stolen. Um, some of these, like these, were, were later recovered, but others um, are still missing, probably uh, destroyed and lost forever. The storerooms and offices were also um, broken into, uh, and around um, 16,000 uh, objects um, uh, thought to have been stolen, about half of those um, are still missing. Well. If um, damage to the Iraqi cultural heritage um, was very serious during after, this is Mosul Museum, uh, incidentally, after the Second Gulf War, uh, nobody um, could have predicted just how bad the situation would become um, in 2014. And Mosul uh, has borne the brunt of this. The, University has been closed since 10th of June, and conditions for the residents of um, Mosul have been absolutely appalling. And since June, there's been a consistent policy by so-called Islamic State authorities to destroy shrines and monuments, and a great number of them have been destroyed. Um, this is supposedly for uh, ideological reasons, but um, there are certainly um, some uh, residents of um, uh, Mosul uh, who don't uh, accept that that is the, uh, the motivation. However that may be, the trail of destruction um, has been long, and amongst the um, shrines and mosques that have been destroyed, um, there's the very famous um, temple, uh, sorry, the, the tomb of, um, of uh, Jonah, uh, which has been a landmark um, on the Mosul um, skyline uh, for many years. There's the minaret um, of the mosque uh, here, seen from the, um, seen from uh, the other mound um, of Mosul. Uh, and as you can see, um, the, the shrine now has been completely destroyed. That was on 24th um, July um, of last year. And what's particularly worrying for archaeologists is that um, it, the mosque is built uh, on the um, mound of Nebi Yunus, one of the ancient... Uh, mounds uh, of, um, of Nineveh, and immediately beneath it and close to the foundations of it, there's a palace of the um, Assyrian uh, king Esau Haddon. Uh, we don't yet know um, whether that has uh, in any way um, been damaged. Um, also uh, in uh, Mosul, the tomb of uh, Jarjis, which was um, renovated by Timur Lang in 1392, uh, also uh, is one of the mosques which, um, um, which has been um, destroyed. It's also been um, substantial damage in uh, other parts uh, of, uh, sorry, we've gone a bit too far, other parts of Iraq. This is the uh, Arba'in um, mosque uh, in, uh, in Tikrit, which is um, dates from the 11th century and one of the most important um, Islamic monuments um, in, uh, in Iraq. Then, um, in late December, um, Islamic State militants um, placed uh, bombs um, around the citadel at uh, Tel Afar, an ancient citadel 70, miles, uh, 70 kilometers west of Mosul and blew up um, some stretches of the fortifications with the declared intention of um, blowing them all up um, in, uh, in due course. There have also been uh, illegal ex excavations there in the Tel Afar uh, citadel. And it's recently been um, reported that explosives have been uh, placed under the fortifications of um, Nineveh 
with the idea of um, blowing them up if the Iraqi army attempts to recapture um, Mosul. Incidentally, uh, this is not new information that I'm giving you. All this is available um, on, on the web if anybody wants to uh, go and have a look there. And uh, amongst that information available on the web is an 11-minute um, video put out by um, ISIS, um, which shows the destruction of shrines in Saladin um, province. Um, we should also, I think, note here that very substantial damage has been done now in northern Iraq to the intangible um, cultural heritage, uh, particularly through the expulsion of, um, of communities and the subsequent elimination of their cultural traditions. So, uh, in July last year, uh, IS seized the historic uh, monastery of Mar Beth Nam and um, expelled the monks. And then in August, um, Christians had to flee from the town of Karakosh and its uh, surrounding um, villages um, when Peshmerga troops um, had to um, withdraw. And then perhaps worst of all, uh, in August, um, IS militants captured Sinjar uh, and massacred many um, Yazidis and uh, 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 apparently some 50 to 60,000 people who escaped the slaughter um, sought sanctuary on Mount Sinjar. Well, what's the world's response been um, to all of these terrible problems in Iraq and Syria? Um, on 3rd December um, last year, just before Christmas, UNESCO hosted um, a major conference uh, in Paris to discuss the problems, and the conference um, produced four recommendations. Number one um, was to uh, consider passing a ban on trading in cultural objects um, from Syria that would um, be similar um, to the resolution which was taken about Iraq in 2003, that's resolution um, 1483. Well, that would obviously be um, a very good thing and uh, might limit the sale um, of uh, antiquities from the region. <clears throat> the second recommendation <clears throat> was to create what they called protected cultural zones around major heritage sites to prevent additional um, destruction. Uh, I have to say uh, that seems to me to be entirely um, impractical uh, in the circumstances. Um, the third one um, was uh, for more emphasis on uh, education. I'm completely um, in agreement with that. I think at the end of the day, the onus on protecting cultural heritage is always going to be um, on, uh, on uh, local communities. More education about the value of cultural heritage can only be a good thing. And the fourth recommendation is a very general one. Um, a recognition that cultural cleansing is not merely a cultural but also a, a political um, emergency, though that obviously uh, is true. Well, moving on now um, to uh, Iran, compared with Iraq, Syria and Afghanistan, um, Iran might seem like an oasis of tranquility, but uh, we mustn't be um, complacent and the purpose of this conference is to highlight some areas where cultural heritage is in danger and where protective um, measures um, are needed. And firstly, I think we should note there always uh, have been problems in Iran um, in the past. Monuments have not always uh, been treated um, with the respect that um, uh, they deserve, and this applies to um, foreign visitors um, just as much um, as to um, local people. Uh, and also, we should uh, remember that there has been a thriving trade um, in antiquities in Iran um, from about the 1920s um, onwards, and the system of having um, licensed um, dealer um, excavations, in the end, I think, has proved to be um, very harmful. Well, then 
secondly, we should recall um, last year's um, conference on the environment and point to the fact um, that um, dan the dangerously high level of pollution in Iran poses a risk to monuments um, um, as well as, um, um, as to public um, health. Um, and in recent years, the problem, of course, has been exacerbated by sanctions, which prevent the importation of modern equipment and technologies um, that um, could uh, help to improve the um, situation. And in addition to chemical um, pollution, sandstorms have become a major hazard in Iran, particularly in the southwest um, of the country. Um, Ahvaz has been um, especially badly affected, and these sandstorms are whipped up in areas often outside Iran, particularly in southern Iraq, where the marshes um, ha have been drained, uh, and on the um, west side um, of the Persian Gulf, but the effect uh, in Iran um, is, um, is very serious. Um, because the air ball and particles of sand are very abrasive and cause a lot of damage to monuments and reliefs carved in um, soft stone. And the adverse effects of acid rain, sandstorms, and uh, atmospheric uh, pollution um, can be seen on um, historical monuments, various historical monuments and uh, uh, historical buildings and archaeological monuments uh, in Iran. Some of the best known sites in Iran have been affected. Even um, the jewel in uh, Iran's crown, um, arguably the most impressive site in the ancient world, which is um, Persepolis. And the problem here is exacerbated by the fact that there's a petrochemical refinery at Marv Dasht. Um, um, uh, just over 10 kilometers to the southwest um, of the site, which puts Persepolis uh, right in the path of the prevailing winds um, from the refinery. And as long ago as 2002, um, Dr. Mohammed um, Talabian, the um, Director of Antiquities, who's going to be um, uh, joining us tomorrow, warned that increasing pollution in the Marv Dash Plain um, was having a damaging, serious effect um, on Persepolis, but nothing actually has been done um, to uh, protect um, uh, the site or improve the um, situation. Well, then, the adverse effects of um, acid rain, sandstorms, and pollution can also be seen on some of the best-known rock-cut monuments um, in Iran, uh, which have visibly deteriorated in the last 40 years or so. Uh, it's certainly the case with the wonderful um, Sasanian period um, reliefs at um, Bishapur, mostly dating from the um, third century uh, AD. Uh, and it's also the case that the, uh, with the famous rock relief uh, carved by Darius um, at Bisatun, which we're going to um, hear about um, later uh, in, the, uh, in the conference. Well, uh, I've come on now to um, dams. Um, there are already more than 200 dams in operation in Iran, and a further 85 are in the planning stage. And each time um, a dam is constructed, it causes damage to the archaeological heritage. And it's a particular problem in a country um, uh, like Iran with such a rich cultural, uh, with such a rich archaeological um, heritage, because it's quite impossible um, to construct a dam uh, without causing damage. Um, to uh, the archaeological uh, landscape of the country. And a very high-profile case has been the construction of the Sivan Dam in the Bolari Gorge uh, between Persepolis and Pasargadi. Uh, although there were fears at one time that the site of Pasargadi itself was at risk, these have proved um, to be unfounded, but the Sivan Dam is uh, in the uh, Achaemenid uh, heartland uh, and uh, many important sites um, have been um, put at risk. Again, we'll hear about that um, later in the conference. 
Well, lastly, I want to draw attention to some examples of bad practice where thoughtless actions and lack of um, uh, proper planning have placed um, cultural heritage at risk. Uh, Taki Bustan um, near Kermanshah, uh, water courses um, have been introduced uh, in front um, of the reliefs um, with the uh, idea of uh, not allowing visitors to get so close um, uh, to the reliefs. Um, they may, they, the water courses may well be effective um, from that point of view, but there's no doubt that uh, introducing um, water um, to the base of the relief itself uh, is likely to cause a problem um, in the long run. And this photograph uh, was taken um, just before Christmas by Rachel Wood. Uh, I'm grateful to her um, for allowing me to use it. Um, another uh, example of the lack of understanding or respect for cultural heritage is at the site of Nushijan um, near Malaya, arguably the most important median site uh, in Iran, dating from the 7th century BC. And here, um, just in the last few years, um, an industrial complex um, has been built a few hundred meters to the northwest um, of the site. The extent of any possible pollution um, is unknown, but it's clearly highly irresponsible to have built such a complex close to an important archaeological site. And if nothing else, the presence of this complex uh, will surely prevent Nushijan from becoming a World Heritage Site if the Iranian authorities decide um, to nominate it for that status. Well, of course, there are many other factors that cause or contribute to damage to cultural heritage, such as uh, development, tourism, neglect, uh, vandalism, uh, and uh, intensive farming. And I'm sure that uh, during the course of uh, this conference, um, reference will be made um, to some of these factors. Thank you very much indeed.